I definitely have a unique perspective on the skills gap, especially in technology and cybersecurity specifically. I believe that we don't so much have a skills gap as we do have a communication gap between what employers think that they're looking for and the talent that is available to them. Uh, you'll notice on a lot of job descriptions, uh, there's the requirements for certifications similar to a CISP for what would be considered an entry to mid-level position that doesn't necessarily require those skills. And I think that a lot Lot of what we can do um, to close that gap is to educate employers, specifically recruiters and HR departments about what each of the roles that they're hiring for really needs as far as the education is, how to measure the skills of a candidate and then bridge the gap in communication between what these recruiters think that they need to fill the position and how to determine what a really great quality candidate looks like for that role. Um, but what I am really passionate about is um, turning over those rocks and exploring where talent may be, where otherwise you may not have already considered that. I think part of the challenge is that as an industry, we tap into the same pools repeatedly um, rather than, than expanding that. And I think that we're changing that gradually as a, as a community. There are so many great initiatives out there. But what I, what I consider, and I, I think of my own story as well as so many um, CISOs who I've talked to who weren't, I mean, cybersecurity wasn't an intended career path, right? But I think that what naturally um, sent us in that direction, that progression is led by a natural curiosity. It's pursuing that course of inquiry if it's something that's interesting to you and finding people who are willing to teach you and educate you and coach you. It's incredible to me how willing to give back our community is. Well, it's interesting to hear about cybersecurity skills gap and pipeline issues and everything like that. When, you know, when I was growing up and learning how to hack and we were creating the professional security disciplines that you could get paid for, um, we were basically inventing those roles as we went along and convincing organizations to pay us for, you know, these services. When, when people think about skills gap, it's that everybody needs cybersecurity professionals, but it's incredibly difficult to actually find entry-level cybersecurity roles. So I think that people really need to take a good look at their organizations, place bets on people who are not from a traditional cybersecurity background, and look, half of us, we hackers who defined you know, a lot of this industry, we weren't from a computer science background. Mudge, you know, one of the most famous hackers from the loft, has a degree in music. I studied molecular biology and mathematics. You can come from a different discipline. What I love is where we look to folks who are professionals in their industry, like healthcare, um, and they take an interest in cybersecurity because suddenly it affects their patients, and they become some of the best you know, the best, most skilled people to defend their industry in ways that outsiders can't do as effectively. So I think we need to get creative about taking the journey from apprentice, journeyman to master in our industry and not keep looking for the masters because where are they supposed to come from? A um, few things. One is for sure there's biases in this industry. Um, and that's the reason why there's still not that many women in this industry. Um, so one of the things is that we have to question the norm. So usually the norm is a, it's usually a white male in the U.S. And it's usually in their, like, it doesn't matter what age group that they are. It's just appropriate. So one of the things that we have definitely noticed is that when women meet, like, 100% of the qualifications, then that's when they apply. Versus men, it's only if it's 60%. And still, if they go through the application process, uh, women are still not selected. And so this is a huge deal because what's happening is that there's still biases around because they'll even pick a man who has 60% of the qualified um, I mean qualifications. And so in the end, the woman is never she's usually they tell them that she's overqualified or she's not technical enough or she doesn't have leadership experience yet and these are all false statements usually um, so we definitely are still battling with the biases in our industry um, the skills shortage i would say that we are heavily still in this uh i guess old opinion and belief that certifications means that that person is able to do their job this is not always true i mean think about it 
most attackers probably don't have certifications and they are doing pretty well for themselves. Um, so I think we have to really grasp that and understand that in security, certifications aren't the basis for the person's performance. And that's one of the things like with point three that I love working with is because we have companies that will actually like use our platform to test out applicants. So it removes the biases because it shows the actual performance. And I think that's something really important. Um, other than that, I always tell people if you are trying to be a pen tester, it could take anywhere from like one to two years. And I always push like get some experience. And even if it's impossible to find an internship where you are, there's this thing called bug bounty. Um, and if you do submit any like vulnerabilities, and whatnot, and it's a public program, you can actually state those companies on your resume. So it shows that you've actually done this work. And I think that's one of the other things um, that people should be more aware of when it comes to bug bounty. And also, if you're already on a security team, believe it or not, bug bounty does um, up your game usually as well because you have to be on top of all the latest tools out there. So you're going to be constantly like looking for, okay, what else can I use here? Oh, this is new. This is really good for me to take back to my security team. Um, it's, it's not a popular position and it's certainly not one that most marketing departments of technology companies are going to cling to, but uh, uh, most people will agree that the weakest link is people, you know, and, and that is uh, reflected in, in um, musings by many people that are on the security side that will refer, refer to, you know, the stupid humans, the stupid users, uh, the muggles, the people that aren't in the know. Um, uh, in terms of a skills shortage, I don't think it's as much a problem that we need to have more people that are trained in security to do specific tasks under the umbrella of this field of security or cybersecurity. I think security needs to be something that's taught and indoctrinated and built into the um, uh, sort of the core values of, of whatever company or institution you work for. It, it needs to be part of the fabric. It needs to be part of the culture. Um, when I first started working for the DOD way back in the 80s, I was working for a research organization where we had secrets and we had safes and locked doors and we didn't have computers, we didn't have networks, but we had secrets and the, and the secrets were information and the information was largely in print. So it was locked in physical safes behind locked doors, behind uh, you know, buildings that were guarded by security, you know, physical security guards in, in, you know, located on campuses that were surrounded with fences. And there were layers of security. You could see the layers of security. Um, but culturally, everybody knew what they were doing in terms of their day job, but they also knew just as importantly what all the rules were for following all the processes and procedures, which by, by the nature of the time we lived in were physical procedures, they were manual procedures, but everybody took it very seriously. So the, because there was multiple stop gaps and, and if there was a single failure, like let's say somebody forgot to lock the safe at night, um, there was other protections in place, but that didn't mean it wasn't important that somebody had left the, the safe open one night. Um, um, so it was very much part of the culture, and, and I, I, I mention that because I might know somebody that left the safe open one night. Um, so, you know, what I'm saying is it is a people problem. It's always a people problem, but the people at large uh, need to understand their role in security. Security needs to be part of the culture, and then the people that have security functions uh, and security responsibilities that are more, you know, monitoring, uh, you know, watching, uh, maintaining all the security technology that's necessarily out there. Um, they have a little bit better leg up and hopefully they're, they're, uh, going to be better off and better, better positioned to actually make a difference. Uh, I don't believe at the end of the day that security means we don't get broken into or we don't get breached or compromised. I think security at the end of the day is you catch it early and you minimize the damage. I, I think there's a, a, we need to concede the reality that breaches are a, a, a clear and present danger. Um, and it, and it's, it needs to be more than simply uh, let's try to avoid it 
happening to us let you know the other guy it happens to let's make sure it's them not us it's so it's due diligence it's it's uh, a, a realistic attention to the fact that this idea of security is not impervious to attack uh, it's how well situated are you to defend yourself against an attack know that the attacks happening and be able to respond to it so oh. Yes, there's a skills gap, but that skills gap is something that should be filled by um, the higher in organisations, the, the, the you know us companies. And the reason I say that is that all too often you hear about all this the, the gatekeeping of roles. You know, must have a CISP. It's as an entry level SOC analyst role that requires five years of experience. You know, that's utter crap. You know, the, we should be looking to invest in people who are passionate about security because you can teach the skills later. Um, if somebody who's got the, the values and the passion and the drive to be engaged in the industry is the sort of person that you want to employ and, and to teach uh, later. Um, you know, the, 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 this concept that we have to find, you know, these round pegs for these round holes every single time that we look is, is ridiculous, to be, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I've employed people who are, you know, PAs to exec leadership, someone who worked in, in retail, you know, somebody who was a, a, a medical uh, sales representative, all because they were driven people and passionate about security, and that's the key element. So, you know, again, um, you know, I, I, a lot of what we need in security is, uh, you know, are people that can uh, can communicate well and, and that have a wide range of skills. You know, not just specifically security skills. Um, you know, so I think uh, you know it's kind of dangerous to put together just a, a security curriculum. And, you know, and just train everybody in the same security curriculum. If we look at the old uh, computer science approach, you know, a lot of people learned to write code, but didn't really learn systems engineering, you know, didn't learn, you know, I worked with a lot of developers that, um, you know, had their masters, you know, went, went very far uh, academically through uh, computer science, um, you know, but didn't understand the ramifications of a memory leak you know, of how disastrous that could be in a large enterprise environment when they're building an application. Uh, because they fundamentally never learned how computers work. And, um, you know, so I think it's kind of dangerous to have like a rigorous, uh, this is what we need to teach our, our high school students, our uh, college students uh, about security to get there. And I, I think we're seeing some of that. You know, we're seeing, you know, it's, it's not uh, just one security curriculum. You know, there's uh, people that train on, on forensics and incidents, incident response, which is very different from security engineering, you know, which is, again, very different from uh, the more operational side of security. Yeah, so it, it's, we, we need broad backgrounds. I mean, at this point in security, we can use pretty much any background. Yeah, psychology background uh, is great. Uh, if you understand business, somebody with an MBA, <laughs> we can use you, that's great. Uh, e even, uh, you know, an arts background, you know, we, we can use that as well. So um, I, I like skills gap. I get frustrated when I hear talent gap, right? I don't think there's a talent gap. There's not a gap of amazing people who want in. When I was doing this apprenticeship program, for every one person we hired, we had around 50 people who were qualified and excited and passionate who just didn't make the cut. So when I hear there's a million and one un, you know, fulfilled jobs, I wonder why are we not doing a better job capturing those other 49 people and bringing them in. So I think there is a skills gap, but it's not the skills gap you think. I think the way most people think that there's a skills gap is I cannot find a Splunk architect with 18 years of experience in the cloud, right? <laughs> That's the skills gap. No, the skill gap is why as organizations and why as a community are we not better at bringing junior people in and moving junior people to mid-level people and moving mid-level people to senior people so that when I need a you know, sim architect with a number of years, I'm promoting within, at the same time, opening space to bring someone right out of college into our field. I think the fundamental skill gap we have is coaching, mentoring, recruiting, and placement. Skills are something that you can learn once you get into a role. There's skills, in my mind, there's skills that are generic skills, skills like I know how to 
set up a network. I can create VLANs on a switch. I can install Windows. I can do some basic things. When you start getting into more detailed things like how do I set up group policy in Active Directory to secure Windows Defender Firewall? That's a very precise and detailed skill. Those are the kinds of skills that you're going to learn on the job. If you don't have those skills, I wouldn't worry about it. Learn what you can learn because skills are like a language. The more you use them, the more fluent you become in those skills, but you could learn them and then not use them and you're not gonna, you're never gonna become fluent in those skills. So from a skills gap perspective, I think the biggest problem is you have people that don't understand the big picture. It goes back to what I said before, get exposure in all the areas of IT infrastructure and business infrastructure. And even from a perspective of learning how to get along with people, to communicate with people, to understand what the business needs are. The biggest thing you have to remember is that you have a job because the business has an objective to do something and most businesses are in the business of making money, right? That's ultimately why a business exists. It's not to be the most secure organization in the world. It's not to be the best at one thing. They're in business to make money. They may say all of these other things, but they're obviously there to make money for the people that started that business. So the more that you can understand how that goal works and how your role in the business contributes to that, the better off you're going to be in the long haul. Is there a skills gap? Yes, there is, because we have such a need for more technologists and something we are working towards. But there's also a little bit of a misnomer where it's the gap between those who are hiring and those who are looking, where those who are hiring may not be asking the right questions, or they have a laundry list, everything they want. They need 14 different skills and certifications, and it's a unicorn they're looking for. And what happens is the people feel disheartened. They're like, well, I'm not qualified to do that, so they don't even bother applying. We see this more actually with females than males. If females don't feel like they're 100% qualified, they won't even bother applying. We're guys, we're just a little more silly and bold. We'll go ahead and apply even if it doesn't fit. But just asking, what do you really need to do the job? What are the required skills? versus the nice to have skills. So this is why making that connection is so important, where you go in and say, what are you really looking for? You said you may need like LAMP, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Do you really need that specific? Or I've been running Ubuntu for five years and love running it. You know, if I understand how to use that, could I run, do a LAMP job? I actually had a student that happened to. She thought she wasn't qualified, when in reality, she was very qualified. She just psyched herself out. So it's just asking the right questions, being bold and ask questions. And it, again, it's okay to ask. We tend to be very introverted as a career field and just reach out and say, hey, I'm looking or hey, I'm looking, whether I'm looking for a job or I'm looking for a candidate and using those human connections to be able to solve this problem. We often hear and talk about the skills gap, and I think it's it's quite a complicated topic, um, partly because this industry is huge. So there might be gaps in skill and um, resource in some areas where actually there's a lot in others. So maybe we need to be a bit more specific when we're talking about the skills gap in terms of what skills do we actually mean, which jobs are we talking about, um, and where do we need to skill up in particular. I know a lot of people who struggle to make the right hires coming from a company perspective but I also know loads of people who are looking for opportunities and are really hungry and really keen to work in cybersecurity or you know to progress so obviously there is something amiss here where we're not quite linking up the people who are looking for jobs with the people who are looking to hire those individuals one key issue I think is those of us that work in the industry are often really busy and trying to make the time to sort of bring people into industry, to train them up, to give them skills and experience, that can feel demanding on top of already demanding jobs. So we maybe need a bit more support, a bit more help getting people skilled up to that point where they're ready to, to jump in. And we also need to understand that actually taking the time to skill people up and train them is a really valuable investment. So many of the CISOs we chat with, um, many of the practitioners in the field, you know, they know that the talent is out there, but bringing it into their organizations is generally a tough part for them. So we think of it as, you know, a skills gap, a talent gap, and a hiring gap. 
all three are kind of working in concert to work against the industry because the gap keeps growing and you can blame it on one or all three or something else. Um, I mean, I would say, is there a talent gap? Yeah, I would say there's probably, there's, oh, there is. there's a, there's a talent gap. I think it's a, um, um, there's definitely an, like an economics problem here and their CISOs wouldn't be talking about having so many problems with human capital if there didn't exist an, exist a gap uh, in terms of where that what the causes of that gap and where it exists and is it a hiring gap is it a not enough people gap I mean it's I think a little bit of it's a little bit of everything um, I also think that the um, security is kind of becoming one of those core competencies that in the past was just part of that you know, part of the security team's job, mm -hmm. but it's now becoming much more um, widespread throughout the organization, and companies need to be thinking more holistically about embedding security into every um, technical team member that exists. Right, in the and I sit on a, a cyber security advisory board for Kane University and also the foundation board there, so I'm constantly interacting with students, with professors, with cyber, cyber security practitioners and trying to get that mixed view and understanding of that skills gap and how to close that in a little bit more. And some of the things that they're doing there, and a lot of universities are doing this also, is combining it with online education and actually bringing in different teachers, professors, expert speakers online within the university community. So if you're going for a cybersecurity degree at a particular university, they're tapping into some of the top talent in three or four or five other universities. So now you're hearing the latest and greatest and you're getting that wonderful education that's really needed, with it, which is cutting edge. And I think that's changing the dynamics a little bit about the education. It's not old school type of traditional education. And I think that's what one differentiator is, where we are and kind of where the future is going. It doesn't always have to be traditional classroom, book, listening to a professor, putting you to sleep. That's not what it is. It's more cutting edge, breaking news, and, and a lot of it's coding and, and doing things hands-on, hands-on keyboard. That type of training and, and skills that could be taught sometimes within a six-month course, a crash course, get somebody up to speed very quickly. And what I found with some of these more crash courses that work in parallel with some of the university degrees, they're getting placed, high-paying jobs, high demand skill set and it focuses them in a nice niche within a huge organization and, and especially younger people they're excited to do this because the challenge is there and they're very motivated and it gets them in the workforce right away they're not waiting around and playing games filling out resumes and hoping to land that job they're getting hand-picked immediately before they even finish their schooling or their education or their certification that's a beautiful thing